The reading today is Exodus 19. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak the people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Make them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for what the people for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows, not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when a ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it, like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people, so they do not force their way through to the see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot cannot come up to Mount Sinai, because you yourself warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, Go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Nathan. Up to the gods where it's very hot in that room up there. If you've got your Bibles, it'd be really good for you to get them out, please. And and I do want to encourage you to bring a paper copy of the Bible if you can. Phones are wonderful, and I realise that for some, the technology is the best way to read scripture um, because of dyslexia and other things like that. That's you brilliant but there is something about reading the paper version and and I was reflecting on this today sometimes you think oh can I be bothered well actually you don't come out without your phone in fact many of us then even go to the loo without our phones so I think we can bring our paper bibles on a Sunday 
So I want to encourage you to, to do that because it helps you follow the scriptures as we go through, especially when um, there's a sermon such as this where we're going to be looking at lots of different scriptures. Uh, just by way of introduction, if you don't know me, my name's Elaine and I'm the vicar here. So let's just pause for a moment and ask the Lord. Lord, would you come and speak to us now? Um, Lord, I thank you for your word that is living and active. And as we study the scripture now, we ask Holy Spirit that you would speak to us individually and together. That your word would not return void as is promised in scripture. So on the onset, we say yes, Lord, to what you want to say to us tonight. And all the people said, your amen is yes, Lord, whatever you want to say to me. So let's have that, that kind of attitude, that frame of mind as we come to Scripture, because God's word is just so wonderful and life-giving. Well, we're going through Exodus, and we're now in the part of the story where they are starting the third month of their time having left Egypt. And they are now entering the desert of Sinai. And I asked the Lord, could he help us get a sense of feeling of that? So I hope you appreciate that the answer to prayer, that we've got some warm weather and you felt a little bit like you're in a desert. What they're doing is they are camped in front of Mount Sinai, as you can see on the picture there. And at this part in the story, we read that Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and gave him a message. And that's the message that we've just had read to us. And we're going to concentrate specifically on verses four to six. And I want us to kind of think of it as a bit like a sandwich. So if you like, there is the first slice, verse four. You yourselves have seen what I did for you in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Then the filling, which is the first part of verse five. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant. And then the top slice, which is the second half of verse 5 and the first half of verse 6. Then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Okay, so are you ready for this sandwich? Lois is ready. Is everybody else ready for the sandwich? Great. It's helpful to have a bit of feedback. It can be a bit lonely up here sometimes. First slice, have it in front of you. Verse four, you yourselves have seen what I did for you in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. If we say the lion is the king of the jungle, we could say that the eagle is the king of the heavens. That's something I read this week and I thought, yeah, that's, that's a helpful memory thing. Lion is the king of the jungle, then the eagle is the king of the heavens. Because in ancient Hebrew culture, the time when this was written, um, eagles were really revered. And I think it, what helps us to think about this, if you remember the time that this was being written, there was no transport in the way that we know it. There were no fast trains. There were no aeroplanes. There weren't fast cars. So all that is around these people actually is nature. And so when you think about that, what they saw of the eagle was really, really powerful. This is the king of the heavens in terms of the bird world. And they would have known the power of the eagle. A few facts to help us see why. And I, I just really enjoyed um, looking up uh, more and more about eagles. And this is what I discovered. That bald eagles can fly 20 to 40 miles per hour. That's 32 to 64 kilometers who operate in that world. And in, that's in a normal flight. And they can dive at speeds of 75 to 100 miles per hour. Now, you imagine they've never, that the people at this time have never experienced that, that speed naturally themselves. And they are seeing the eagle. That's how they're seeing the power of this bird. Eagles can fly at altitudes of 10,000 feet. That is flying higher than most commercial helicopters. And they can soar on the air for hours, riding on natural wind currents and thermal updrafts. So imagine in this Hebrew time, they're looking up and they are just seeing. We do see that still today, of course, because such birds exist. But you see them just riding on the thermals, riding on the wind. What a beautiful 
beautiful, powerful image. The eagle's vision is four to five times better than that of a human being. They have the best vision of all living things, the clearest, the sharpest vision, such that they can spot a rabbit 3.2 kilometers away. And they can see fish swimming whilst, the, obviously the fish, oh, it's a silly statement this, whilst they're in the water. That's a really stupid statement, isn't it? Of course the fish are there. But the point is they can see the moving fish. You think from the height we're describing there. They can lock down and zoom down at speed of 30, 330 kilometers an hour and they never lose sight. Such is their eyesight. They can see it. And they can catch and lift the weight of a deer. And for eagles, a storm doesn't scare them. They are fearless when it comes to storms. They actually use the storms to lift them higher. They rest on the wind of the storm. The storm doesn't control them. They rest on the wind of the storm. And the pressure of the storm actually helps them to glide without even using their energy because their wings are uniquely designed that allows them to get in a locked position amid violent storm winds. It's incredible, isn't it? What an amazing God we have. That's just one of the creatures he's made, by the way. What an amazing, it's such a powerful image. And so you can see why the Hebrew people were using this as the image that describes the awesomeness, the powerfulness of God. And, it, and you can see how this then helps us understand the rest of the message that Moses is told to bring. Listen to the awesomeness, the power of God from verse 16 onwards. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently as the sound of the wind grew louder and louder and Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. That is the awesomeness of God. Can you even begin to imagine experiencing that? I can't. I think I'd have just been in a ball crying, scared to death. That's why the eagle is represented here, but it's, it's a description. And this is what the people actually experienced of the awesomeness, the power of God. Elsewhere, if you want to turn to Deuteronomy 32, by the way, if you're not aware, Deuteronomy kind of echoes the same story of the Exodus. You get different elements of it. But Deuteronomy 32 verses 11 to 14 also use this image of the eagle. It talks of Yahweh God and says, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft, the Lord alone led them. No foreign God was with him. It's a beautiful image. Now, a bit of a spoiler here. If you study eagles, you will discover that they don't actually carry their young on their wings. It is a picture. But what you do see is at the right time, the mother will, will nudge and encourage the eagles to begin to fly. That's what they do. They almost like, you know, effectively push them out of, of the nest. It doesn't literally say that in the stuff I've read, but it's, it's time to fly. And so, but what the, they don't, they don't just zoom up. It's like, off you go. I'm going to get on with my life now. No, the mother soars with them and shows them what to do and is observing and is watching. And you can look at some of this on YouTube. What a privilege we have to be able to see nature in that way. And that's actually what God does. It's really interesting that it's about two months old when these eagles begin to learn to fly, but they return to the nest in the evening. Um, it's such an image of how God deals with us. He does push us out of the nest at times, and that's what we've been seeing with the people of God. It's, it's, it's not just, I'm going to take you out because uh, I'm a lovely God and I'm going to monocoddle you and you're my precious. No, we have a God who says, rise up, people of God. He wants us to grow and we're meant to be, we are made in the image of God. So we're meant to soar too on the wind of God. 
It's an amazing, it's a glorious picture. And so when we see eagles elsewhere in Scripture, and there are other passages too, you could do a word study on this. The point is made that the eagle is speaking of the power of God, the protection of God, the love of God, and the tenderness of God. You yourselves have seen what I did for you in Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Note that the Lord didn't just take the people out of um, Egypt to rescue them from slavery. It was to bring them to himself. And that's the ultimate rescue for all of us, our salvation. Our eagle God, so to speak, wants us to know him intimately. We've sung tonight, you are jealous for me. Again, that's a scriptural thing. Um, Sometimes, and I've learned this um, can I tell you a funny story? It's at, it's at my son-in-law's expense. It's so great. I can call him my son-in-law now, but it's at my son-in-law's expense, but it's a really important lesson for us to learn. So um, my daughter and uh, uh, her fiancé, Brogan, got married last Saturday. And um, a couple who've travelled with them are Claire and Pete, and they did the prayers for them. And so they had a couple from their own church pray for them and Claire and Pete. And... Uh, they stood kind of the equivalent of here and they were facing the congregation. And Pete said at one point, um, so uh, open your eyes and look at the people who are here for you. We're here for you. And he encouraged us to look at them. And he said, so now I'm going to pray for them. And he did. And as part of his prayer, he played, prayed the blessing. Now, the blessing for some of us is known um, as a song. And that was true. That was known for Brogan, so the blessing is, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you, blah, blah, blah. And so Pete said that in his prayer. Afterwards, Brogan said, um, I see you did a bit of a Gavin and Stacey, so if you're Gavin and Stacey fans, you know that they quoted a song at a, a crucial point uh, in one of their episodes. And he said to, to Pete, um, so you did Gavin and Stacey uh, in, in quoting the blessing. And Pete said, Brogan, it's in the Bible. And my daughter said, yeah, it's in Numbers. And he just thought Pete was quoting a song. So it's really important we know Scripture, isn't it? He's only been a Christian for a year. So I love the fact. So let's not assume that people know what we're talking about. And, you know, that song that we just sang, he is jealous for me, that's because that is in Scripture. That God is a jealous God. That's how passionate he is for us. So another scripture, just to, to continue on the uh, eagle theme for a moment, is from Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. And I felt the Lord draw me to this particular scripture um, because it, I think it speaks to some of us tonight. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Our eagle God teaches us how to soar on wings like eagles. And so if you're tired and you're weary, as some of these people were, they traveled in the desert, they were tired and weary. Receive that promise tonight. Stand on that promise. That scripture is for you. So let's come now to the filling in the sandwich, verse 5, the first part. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant. There are types of covenant within scripture. And I just want to talk about the unconditional and the conditional. So there are major figures in the Old Testament. And the first major one for us, in many ways, is Abraham. And his covenant was unconditional. It was a covenant where God was determined to call out a special people of himself. And he said to Abraham, who was the person he'd chosen, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse, and whoever curses you, I will curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
It's an unconditional covenant. Actually, Abraham tried to make this happen for himself and he got it wrong. But because it was an unconditional covenant, it has come to fruition. But when we look at the covenant that is being made here from Exodus 19 onwards, there's a condition to it. It's often known as the Mosaic covenant because it was given to Moses. And it's, it's conditional because it is subject to people being obedient to the law that the Lord is going to give, as we will see in chapter 20. We're not discussing that tonight, but it is conditional. It's conditional because there... The, the promise within it is dependent, their blessing is dependent upon their obedience. This covenant would serve for the nation, the, the nation of Israel, God's people, who are chosen, leading them forward to a time when there would be the, an unconditional covenant that God would make with us through Jesus Christ. And it's an important covenant, but it does differ from Abraham's, as I said because it is linked to blessings and curses. If you want to read on that, go to Deuteronomy 28 later. So there is an old covenant that we're talking about, but there is a new covenant that we find in Jesus. In the new covenant, though, we still cannot save ourselves. The old covenant really points to the fact that we cannot save ourselves, and it points to Jesus, to the ultimate sacrifice. It points to the holy lifestyle we're meant to live and hold to. But in Jesus, we recognize we cannot save ourselves only through his redemptive grace, only through his death, resurrection, and ascension. It's the whole package. But it is an unconditional love. And yet, Jesus, in fulfilling the law, sets the bar even higher. And so God's love for you is not conditional. But if you really want to walk the Jesus way, if you really want to apply his death and resurrection and ascension to your life and live in the power of spirit, we are called to be obedient. Jesus says in John 14, if you obey my words, obedience is there. And that's what's happening here. And it is a call to holiness. Because God is holy. And that's why the people couldn't even descend the mountain. To even go near, they would, have, they would have died instantly. Such is the holiness of God. And we read in Hebrews that Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension has meant that we can go straight into what's called the holy of holies. Straight into the throne room of God. What a privilege. What a, every time you pray, every time you turn to Jesus, you, you have direct access into the holy of holies. But let's remember he is holy. And that's what this reminds us of when we're reading this. Our God is holy. That's why we were doing confession earlier. But holiness is about a choice to live the Jesus lifestyle, to live Jesus' way. And that really does mean dying to self. But if we die to ourselves, we get life and life in all its fullness. I've just rattled a whole load of scripture there to you just in conversation. And if you don't recognize the scriptures, hallelujah, that means you've got the challenge to go make sure you get really into scripture. Because our God is holy. And I do not stand here before you as the holiest person. I often look at people within our church family and I'm like, Lord, I want to be as holy as that person. I want to follow you like that person. Let's encourage each other in our walk with Jesus. And the thing about holiness, it's very simple. If you just say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to convict me about? Because we're all a work in process. And he will convict us because he wants to make us holy like Jesus. And that's the filling. It's a call to obedience. Yes, We've been rescued. We can soar on eagles' wings. We can know the almighty, awesome power of God. But the filling is our obedience and saying yes to him. And so the last slice of the sandwich then, the second slice, verse 5, second half. Then out of all nations you will be my treasure possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests 
and a holy nation. Um, St. Peter reiterated this and spoke this over the church. You read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people. That means you, you. We're not talking about the Israelites now. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare of him who called you out of darkness into his, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I believe the Lord wants to remind us that we are his treasured possession. And if you treasure something, you really care for it. It is really special. The question I've got, is he our treasured possession? Do we act like we are a treasured possession? Do we care about how we look after our bodies, what we feed our minds? Do we care what we interact with spiritually? Here tonight, you have mercy. You are his treasured possession. And it's from that place of knowing who we are, the eagle God who carries us on eagle's wings, from that place that then we can love him as our treasured possession. And when we know we're treasured, we care about other people. This afternoon, um, Pete, who is at service coordinating for us this evening, thanks, Pete, for your first night doing this. Um, before we came here, we've been, um, the two of us with Beulah, uh, over at uh, one of our church members' houses, Annette, praying for the area where she lives, which has a dominance of um, Hindu guys and Muslim guys, and just praying for God's kingdom to come in that place. Annette has lived there for 17 years, and she is so faithful in praying for her neighbours. I cannot tell you, I think, wow, you know, for me, she's up there on that. Her faithfulness. She loves her neighbours. She shares Jesus with them. As we're here, she's eating donuts with one of her Indian neighbours who's invited around, caring for people, loving people, reaching out for people. And I know that many of you are doing the same in your different settings. You are reaching out for people. That's because all people need to be God's treasured possession. But they won't know that unless we tell them. How does a child know they're loved? They know they're loved because they are told, because they are held, because they are treated kindly. A child who is not told that they are not loved, who is not held with tenderness, uh, who doesn't receive hugs, who isn't cared for, does not know that they are special, does not know that they are loved. Our job as God's treasured people is to proclaim his praises as St. Peter says. We are priests. Now, some of us hold the office of a priest, so that's myself and Jitesh and James and maybe some others in the room, I don't know if we've got other ordained people. But actually, scripturally, we are called a royal priesthood. And that's because one of the roles of a priest is to act as that mediator. First role is to worship the Lord. Well, that's your job as much as it's my job. We are to minister to the Lord. That's the first job of a priest. But a priest is also a mediator. And again, in Corinthians, you read that we are the mediators sharing Jesus with others. And I think sometimes if we understand our corporate calling as a royal priesthood, that helps us think about, actually, am I acting and living like a priest? Do people recognize that I am a mediator between them and God? That's your calling. We're our calling. We are a royal priesthood. And finally, we are a holy nation. I've already explained about holiness and given some thoughts on that. I want to suggest that we really need to get to grips with Scripture and read Scripture not through the world's eyes, not through our own perspectives. I heard described this week that some of us are, in fact, many of us are discipled by the world. And I think that's true. So who is discipling you? Is Jesus discipling you? 
are we discipling each other according to the ways of Scripture, which don't always sit comfortably with us? Are we open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit? So that's tonight's sandwich. First layer. You've been taken out of Egypt. You saw on eagle's wings. We've been explained that. You are called to obey. But know you are his treasure possession. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Amen.